Only the best at Unity of Sedona. Thank you. Um, a couple topics for today, please. Service. Service? Conflict of interest. Automatic writing. What was it? We don't do that anymore. <laughs> okay? Emerging. Emerging? Divine masculine. That's good. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yes, it is Father's Day, so happy Father's Day. That's that talk. Um, and, I, and I say that uh, in, in sincerity because I, um, there are so many, um, you know, every year we do this holiday and Memorial Day, whatever it happens to be. Um, and I, for many years, we did the talk on that topic, you know. So I don't typically like to repeat a talk, even though people are very gracious and they say they don't mind. And it's going to be different no matter what anyway. Um, but I don't like to repeat if I can avoid it, just to do the, the most for everybody to hear something uh, new or fresh, kind of spontaneous. So I, I most of the time would not do. Um, uh, Christmas is an exception, maybe New Year's, because it's really a great time to talk constructively about new beginnings. But other than that, through the year, I'm typically not going to do um, holiday talks much anymore. I'll, I'll try to tie it in if I can. but. You know, uh, it's not what I'm going to do typically. But um, you can also go and watch the videos on those topics. They're on YouTube or the videos. We have one called Holy Days. It's a video set, DVD set. Um, and it's got, it covers all those holidays. So you can go and check that out, all right? Um, as soon as you, one of you asked the word emerging, um, that even just that word, for me, I'm a very, you know, visual, I guess you could say, type of person. So for me, I get pictures and then they turn into words when I'm doing a talk. It's hard to explain because it's not an, a linear thing where I get a picture and talk about the picture. The picture holds information, right? That's what I'm talking about. A sound holds information. We've talked about the ancient civilization of Lemuria and how words were actually concepts being shared. Um, by the same token, you know, the saying, a picture is worth a thousand words. One of the most uh, uh, outstanding universal symbols is a spiral. We just talked about spirals, right, and uh, cycles of life. But um, the music that was just shared, isn't that stellar? See, and that's like, it's, it's not, you're not being played at. It's not, hey, I'm going to do a performance now. Watch me. It's, it's everybody's involved with that. We set that intention here. So the musicians that step up here, and it's interesting because you think that having been around, uh, that, that, that they would understand these concepts, especially if they're used to playing in spiritual centers. And I love hearing some of those that are traveling and they stop by. They step up here to play, and later they're like, what was that? It's like they stepped into a vortex. Well, you did. Sedona. But it isn't just Sedona, because something can be wonderful. You can say, oh, I love the concept of healing, or vortexes, or multidimensionality, or UFOs, or whatever topic. And where do you go with that? Why do you have an interest in any of these? All of them should be going one collective place, and that is home. It shouldn't be taking you out this way. It should be coming in this way and aligning with this, your center. So I just, that, that word emerging, I just had this vision recently where I was seeing a sea, seascape. And above the ocean, not in the ocean, above the ocean, I saw these dolphins spinning in the air, OK? Uh, spirals, it's a, it's a symbol of something. In a sense, it, the, the closest word you could say synonymous with these spirals is energy. 
And when you take a concentration of energy, 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 um, they can become a vortex. Because what happens is, if energy, the spiraling, you know, it's like uh, the, uh, um, Van Gogh's Starry Night. Why does he have in his painting spirals up in the sky? Even things that aren't spiral, like a sun, there's this swirling energy around it. Because he was such a sensitive soul, to him, there was spiraling energy everywhere. So energy doesn't sit. It doesn't, it's not a linear thing. It moves and it dances and it, it's impossible for it not because then you'd have stagnation and death. So life is energy. But human beings have learned to believe that we're separate from love, from God, from the divine. And we taint spirally creative energy with fear and hate. So what starts to happen is you could say the spirals start to go backwards, like a de-evolution instead of evolution. The, the, um, the Nazis took the swastika, and that's a Hindu symbol, and they reversed it, but people don't know that. They reversed it because it means going the other way, into darkness instead of light. But they knew that the Hindu were onto something. They knew that the Tibetan masters were onto something. Why do they have these symbols? Because it's a sign, a symbol of energy, movement. And they use the same thing with drumming. Hitler would go and do a talk. There would be this thump as he's talking quietly in the background, kind of, you know, something under the, uh, behind the curtains, as it were. And then as he built a fervor in talking, the drum would build more. So everybody's in a mass hypnosis. The music's taking them. Anything can be taken the wrong direction. And mankind by nature, by ego nature, constantly does this. It saddens me at times because something can seem wonderful, like the swastika, and somebody turns it. So if you go and get a, a, a Tibetan Buddhist symbol, swastika on your arm, somebody's going to shame you for it because of their misinterpretation. You see? Um, there's teachers, movies, music, you know, musicians, bands that you say, I really love. And then somebody comes up with something about them to take you out of loving anything. And that's definitely evil. Gossip is a form of evil. Hatred, gossip, all of that. But some of it seems so covert. And um, you like something, someone's going to try to turn you away from it. Um, look what Christianity has caused a lot of people to turn away from, say, Jesus, because, as though he's responsible for inquisitions. So it's really messed up. You could be uh, wearing a Buddhist shirt, you know, a, a Buddhist symbol on your shirt and be around Christians, and they might get all funny about what's that Buddha thing, and that's a false god, it's the devil, and so on. I was in a metaphysical bookstore about 30 years ago, and I remember, you know, this, this guy walked in, and I was buying a book or an incense or something, and I heard, overheard this conversation, this guy, what's this? What are you, why are you selling yoga books in here? Yoga! And he's going, that's evil. It's of the devil. Now, I wonder what religion he might be practicing. But, it, and I'm like, and I turned around and I go, what? <laughs> Yoga. It's of the devil. I go, really? Wow. Things I don't know. And he goes, yeah, yoga's a god that they worship while they're doing these postures. <laughs> really? How many years did you study yoga to discover this? Oh, well, my pastor said. Your pastor's nuts, you know? Like, you need to get a different pastor. Have him pass on to, you know, move on to something else. But people will throw these things out, and it becomes truth to them. Did you know Jesus, da, 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 da. And Jesus didn't really die on the ground. Jesus, and, and they, anything to humanize goodness. But if you take God and humanize God, and then find flaws in humans, nothing's divine. There's nothing good anymore. All you have is getting by. You just hope to get by one more day. So concepts of energy got shamed. Uh, you know, Native American culture gets shamed. Uh, it's just so strange. But it's not 
strange if you understand. This is the goal of the ego within human minds. Leave nothing standing, nothing worth respect. And um, this concept, you, you can't, you can twist things, but you can't completely change them. The concept of energy, these spirals and these dolphins, I'm seeing, you know, wow, what's this, you know, what's going on? And, I, and that it downs load meaning to me. But the idea, spirals, energy, you go to Native American sites, they're either painted or carved in rock, spirals. You go to Newgrange in, Newgrange in Ireland, spirals. England, Asia, why? Because they're, the people that made those didn't invent the idea. They were honoring. So today you go down the street in Sedona and you'll see a sign that draws your attention because it's a healing center, let's say. But there are symbols that let people know, including signs that say healing center. But the, the ancients didn't write healing center at their temples. They just carved spirals. And it meant you're going to go somewhere. This is a place of going, growing, emerging. You know, and so, and, and, and if they carved or painted them large or multiples, there are some, like people look at uh, um, Buddha's cap. You know, they, a lot of people go, what's with that? Is that like a weird hairdo? Uh, it, it isn't. If you, you look at the cap on Buddha's head, it's the thousand petaled lotus. But what it means is spiral, spiral. All those spirals are energy. So the symbol of Buddha with this cap, with, you know, dozens and dozens, countless technically number of these little spirals means high consciousness. You see, you do meditation and your body sometimes will start to move. You hear music and you'll start to move, dance. Something beautiful is happening. Energy is being activated. You even, even particles of matter atomic particles they're not dead they're they're not visibly vibrating and spiraling but they are doing it their movement becomes activated to where it's perceptible by humans when humans activate those particles they started as waves and those waves are like starry night those waves are moving but science hasn't figured out how to see that yet so they think they're not moving but those waves become activated particles. And to really understand, people use this word technology. I've done conferences with people I respect. They're really wonderful teachers. But it, I've, it always has blown my mind that they can't get away from the word technology. They'll go, you know, divine technologies, love technologies, light technology. Stop making things technical. It's God. Oh, exactly. Divine technology. No. You're trying to humanize. You're trying to take God and put him in a screwdriver, a technology, a thing. Why don't we let go of naming and step into becoming and feeling and experiencing? See, and that's what ancients did. When they see a plant, they didn't use technology to figure out what's in the plant. They asked the plant, what are you? And it would download. And yes, they could... They could at some point start to tactile, touch, taste, smell it. What are you? And, and go into trance. There's ancient stories even about coffee. Someone sitting at the plant, a shaman, and it downloading the benefits of this particular bean or whatever, you know. Uh, this is not uncommon. This is what ancients on all continents did. They ask. There are drawings of molecules that are thousands of years old. Clearly, the atomic structures... And molecule, molecular structures, there it is. The human heart, for that matter. There's drawings and carvings of ancient things. Thousands of years ago, they already had drawings and carvings of acupuncture meridians and points. How did they know where they were without computers to tell them? There's, there's a knowingness beyond all technology. And you know, humanity, sadly, has lost a lot of that. But I will say that it's not that hard to get it back. But you have to be willing to ask something that we're not used to asking anymore. Every president 
and leader, whether it's mayor level or household level, moms and dads, should start their day asking, what would you have me do? How can I be God on earth today? Not arrogant God, but I mean, how can I be the presence of the divine today? And it would give you practical answers. You can be nothing but a mechanic and you work on cars. You can start your day. What would you have me do and not do today? And you could take that business into an inspired, you know, vortex mechanic, you know, um, inspired and, you know, like channeling. I channel uh, car repair. I mean, it would be cool. If people could just get back to that, and I know somebody that's a mechanic that does that, and it's, it's, the stories are bizarre, bizarre, the, the things that they can manifest um, miraculously. So what's considered ancient, you know, um, just hearsay isn't hearsay. The ancients understood these things. The Lemurians understood these things, the Atlanteans understood them, but the Atlanteans went into technology. And we're going back to the destruction of Atlantis in our modern time. Because everybody's gotten so um, addicted to the use of linear technologies instead of the beingness. You know, the heart. And I'm not said, saying the head has no place. The head has one place to follow the heart. If the head follows the heart, then the head will have a proper place to implement the things the heart's asking it to do. And the heart needs to be answering to spirit that tells it what to do. So the hierarchy of creation is God into your heart, into your mind, into your life. It needs to move in that direction. That's the chronology of healthiness. Unhealthiness is any splitting off of any of those steps or levels. So this, to me, this spiraling energy, you know, um, there's a movement. Somebody has has stirred something, the ethers. Just like a magician or, or a Wiccan, for example, you use the bowl and you use the wand. The wand is focused mind, the bowl is the universe. I'm deciding to stir into the pot something today. You put your herbs, whatever you want to put, but the symbolism of the, the, the wand is my mind in the world, I am activating something. So you can stir, and that's one example, spiral. And then there's a chant that these ancient magicians often used. It was starry, starry night. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but they're doing the same thing that Van Gogh's seeing in his spirals up in the sky. Stirring, 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 wonderful. And as you stir, you can chant, you can pray. Why? Because you're enforcing your intention into what the wand is doing in the universe. It's kind of like saying you've shown up. Someone has shown up. And so the universe, it's not a technology, these atomic particles and waves. The particles and waves are going, whoa, someone is showing up. Let's dance with them. And if you hold that vibration, even on an intimate level, holding a child who's needing nurture or a partner, a lover, when you show up in that state of consciousness, all the atoms start responding. They start dancing with delight to be in the presence of a holy one, which is you. Because you've set aside the garbage of the life in today and said, how can I be the presence of God today? How can I be with you, my partner? And, you, and you're holding presence. And I'm saying to you, and, and some of you would obviously know these kinds of concepts such as, Every particle has its own level of intelligence, but it's there to serve you. You are the co-creator of this universe. And that which we can see has come from us. God created a universe you cannot see. You can only feel it, and you can only feel it when you let go of seeing it. As long as your senses are still guiding you, it, the doors are closed, you can't experience the universe God created. That's why so many Course in Miracles workbook lessons are related to and revolving around neutralizing what I started trusting, my senses instead of the feeling. So there's a point where we say, okay, even if I can't see spirals of energy up in the sky, they're there. Practice feeling them. Well, how do I know if I'm feeling? Here comes some music and you started doing this spiraling around, move, you know, you must be feeling something. 
See, and so, so maybe you move with it a little, and that's enough to know you're responding. I've done demonstrations where I stand a person up and I ask them to close their eyes. I can go near, they don't hear me, but when I put my hands up and reach towards them, it's all quiet. They don't hear me walking towards them. That would be obviously, uh, you know, they would pick up on that. So quietly I can do this towards them. And you'll see that person standing there and you'll see them either rocking back and forth or, or moving around in circles. Because even with our eyes closed, we know. We can feel it. You're meditating and all of a sudden, hmm, sound. Because you're responding. You're responding to something. What are you responding to? We have ways of responding to hurt and fear and hate. We start to body language like that. Blocking, shutting down, aura shuts down. Chakras shut down when we're scared. Live long enough in fear and trauma and everything stays shut down. It's post-trauma, locked up. And then we're looking for ways to trust again, to come out again. So that's why healing, sound healing, it can be effective because it is flying in under the radar to, you know, sort of loosen up the tensions. And I would love to see more teachers being more aware of what's really happening so they can tell everybody what's happening. Instead of just, let's say, doing a sound healing, for example, and everybody attends and they feel good and they leave. I, I would really love to see more of the instruction to say, and by the way, some of your movement was unlocking old wounds so that they can walk away working on that instead of only thinking they attended and now they're not attending the sound healing. Continue it. Keep, keep it going. You just unlocked some things. Now I'd like to recommend that when you go home tonight after the sound healing, stand and just let this continue. Let yourself move. You're on your own. You have privacy. Just move. Move. Do the dance of the seven veils. Twirl. You know, it's supposed to be passionate. It's supposed to be alive. These energy spirals are not dead. They're not like dots just sitting there. They're in movement. So why aren't we in movement more? And when people say, no, no, we need stillness, not movement. In your stillness, there's movement. If you're tapping into life and love. Totally still, meditating. You think that it's all about being still. Be still and know that I am God. It didn't say be still, period. Be still and know that I am God. So as soon as I'm still, I start to know the I am presence of God. And I feel like dancing. And I feel like here comes a poem. And here comes a song. N don't, not to shame. This is life. Move, dance, experience. I mean, to me, it's a no-brainer. It's so beautiful to allow ourselves to step into the spiral of life. And throughout ancient civilizations, you know, this, this, this was there. People knew this. They would, you know, you'd have these centers where it's a, a place of high energy. And they also thought of them as ascension, places of ascension, places of healing. Usually it's healing and inspiration, really. But a lot of these places were considered multidimensional portals. So you have energy. You have a symbol of the energy because in this place is energy. Once you start bringing it enough energy in, you start to experience a vortex. So vortexes are not everywhere, but they are everywhere. Meaning we don't always have a major chakra in every town and village on the planet. There are seven primary chakras on the, on the planet because there are seven primary chakras on your body and we live in a symbiotic relationship with the planet. Toxify your emotional center. You toxify yours. I'll toxify mine. We all toxify ours. And we're in a symbiotic relationship with the earth, so we're doing what? Toxifying her emotional body. Yeah, you see? Toxify your root chakra enough, her root chakra is going to be imbalanced because we're in a symbiotic relationship. We push and pull with her, you know, as co-creators, you could say. The fire chakra, you know, same thing. So our job, there's this phrase, heaven on earth. 
Our job is not to beg God to give heaven to earth that's all messed up. Our job was always supposed to be the love we want to see in the world, to be the change you want to see in the world. Without us doing it, it is not to be done. Keep praying and asking God. It isn't going to work. You, you don't have enough tears to beg God to fix your life or the world. It's not going to happen. God doesn't go, oh, don't start with the tears. Now I'm going to want to help you. <laughs> That's not how God works. God's will is that everything is already perfect, but you can't see it because it's invisible to you because you're living in a world that you're manufacturing that you're manifesting, which like I said before, is man's infestation. You're manifesting a corrupt world and you're using your senses to determine whether you have a good day or a bad day, all based on your perceptions. Today's been a good day because I came out ahead of somebody else. Today's a bad day because they came out. I mean, this whole dog eat dog world has nothing to do with God. Michael, answer us, oh wise one. Why did God create a world where this happens? He didn't. Next. This is us. This is us. And all of this is being mirrored to us. And that's the will of the mother to say, honey, I'm just here to help you manifest your internal belief system so that you'll want to get over them. You know, it's kind of cool. And in, in a way, it's like a personal trainer, the mother, or a a healer to be able to say, here's what's going on with your body. And if you do this, it'll help you. That's kind of the mother's role, the Holy Spirit's role. I'm here to reflect to you what's going on so that you might want to work on that. But the human race is so intent on being afraid that there's reactiveness to so many things. You know, uh, as soon as there's a good, it gets attacked. And fear, just, you know, constant. I've seen, you know, I'm not into politics at all, but, you know, I've seen people that were good-hearted people run for office and the world just beats them up. It doesn't allow them to even start to try to make a change. And, and that, that defeatist concept, consciousness, is evil. And, and when I say evil, it's the ego gone rampant in us. I'm not happy, I'm not going to allow you to do something in this world. I remember meeting a mayor of Sedona who said to me once, you know, couldn't believe what I was hearing, but I was so impressed because of the honesty. And they said, you know, I'm so glad to no longer be mayor here because everything we ever tried, people complained about it. If we said, we're going to do this, oh, complain, complain. Okay, never mind, we'll do that. Oh, complain, complain. So that there would never be anything done. And I thought, you know, and people say, you know, Michael, you should run for mayor. You should run for president. You should. And, and I, there's a humor to that. Because you know what I would do? I would say, thank you for electing me. Good night. We'll see you tomorrow. And while you're sleeping, I would change everything. <laughs> and let you complain about it tomorrow, because I won't go online to hear your complaints. <laughs> but everything, that's what we did with Unity of Sedona. I came in and boom, we made changes. I had, I had ministers, seasoned ministers uh, from different uh, beliefs. And they would say, remember, Michael. The one thing, never make changes for the first year or two. <laughs> you mean the first minute or two. I'm not going to go somewhere and live in the stagnation or things that are not working and just wait till you give me permission to make a change. I'm going to just make changes and say, why did you create that? Why are you here? Do you like the changes? And it's always yes. You know, some people, we get a new property. Well, you know, we don't know. We don't know if you should get it. Whatever, we got one. And now you attend or you don't attend. And here you are, the room's full of people. You can't live in fear. And if you're a parent, you make changes. You don't wait for everybody's acceptance. It's beautiful. I like to communicate. So I'll let people know what we're doing. I don't literally mean I'm going to do covert things. I love communication, letting people know. But what I'm saying is, if someone doesn't like it, I will not let them paralyze me or us. That is called codependence. You've got to follow inspiration. You've got to get the spirals moving. And evil's going to tell you, if you get them moving to the right, here's what's wrong with that. Get them moving to the left, here's what's wrong with that. Therefore, don't do anything. And now you have a, 
a job for too many years. You, you, you didn't need to be there that many years, a relationship too many years. And that's this world, man. And, and it just beats people up, defeats them, depresses them. Then there's medications they go on to deal with, and that's not going to help. The spiral of life, awakening, energy, beautiful. And these, when you take enough of these spirals that are symbols of energy, take enough energy, put it in a place, it's ready to be activated. There's all this energy building, building, building. Now, who's going to take control of it and do something with it? So when you step in your household, you've got your little altar room, you've got your incense. Do you know that each one of those things is moving a little bit of energy? It's building and building. So if you go there and worship your incense, you've made them the God that's in charge of the spiral in your house. You have to step up and be the God goddess in your household and say, all incense, all chimes, all bells, all phone calls for that matter are to be done in the name of God. And then all of these atomic particles, waves that become particles, the particles start to dance with delight going, oh, someone has shown up. Hey, come here, particle. Particle, come here. Every old particles gather around. Someone's showing up. Check this out. There are two or more gathered in one place, which is you and anything else. <laughs> you know? I have decided we're going to do this. And, and here, Unity of Sedona, or anywhere, you know, that I uh, participate, I'm all about that, that alignment. If you are horizontal and you have, you know, they say, you know, a, a camel is a, a horse created by a committee. Too many humps, too many extra parts. You know, so you, you end up with everybody pitching in opinions and you can't go anywhere. See, and we've had meetings about, you know, our name change that we're going to do eventually. But the idea is I want to include everybody's feedback. But don't attend the meeting of joining for feedback if you don't know how to move with the dance that's happening. So if we start saying, let's just say as an example, let's call ourselves a something center instead of a church or whatever else. Let's go with center. One person. No, but I like church. I understand that, but we're past that. 99 people in the room are saying, let's go with center, not church. Oh, well, I don't like that. Okay, bye. Now, the rest of us, 99 now, the other 99 become 100% of the room. And there's a movement. There's a feeling. Because it's all about God. What is our way of, of anchoring the most presence of God today? And then it starts to speak. If you use your head to make decisions, it's always hit and miss. Because some moments you're inspired, some moments you're ego-based. But when you set the intention to say, you know what? I don't know the new name. I only know that I'm ready to take this to a new level of Christ consciousness or God. Now, if we can all agree, and I didn't say what it was, right? No name, right? I just said what? The intention. Well, I don't like your intention. I want this to be a gymnasium part-time. <laughs> then go to a gymnasium and rent it on Sundays to do spiritual services. This isn't going to be a gymnasium. Oh, well, you're closed-minded. Okay, thank you. Bye. It doesn't matter to me. I know what I'm about. These people, online and in person, have to decide if this guy resonates with where they want to go. And then if I resonate with where you want to go, we are responsible to make sure the center goes where we want to go. So we set st certain standards. Our policies, procedures, systems should all fit within that without contradiction and without a conflict, as it were, as best you can. It's called staying in alignment. When you see me, you see the Father, is the way Jesus puts it. You should be able to say that about your home. It shouldn't be like you come here wearing white and purple, wearing a crystal and, you know, beloved, oh, and I'm staying, you know, and then we go to your, your house and it's a train wreck. It shouldn't look like that. I'm not saying you need to go home and clean your house today. <laughs> I'm saying, where do you have incongruence? You see, it should all kind of, when you see me, you see the father. It's not going to be like, you know, I talk love and abundance and yet I, I know nothing about service and, and donating. Love and abundance means this is who I am. And I'm so into abundance, I give. That should be our vibe. If you say you're into healing, oh, 
you know, namaste and welcome to my healing room. And I have a water fountain in the corner. I painted the room in special particular colors. There are healing frequencies, greens, and you know, and I have chakra banners, and you know, and I'm, go ahead and get ready and, and sit on the chair there and prepare. And I'm going to just, I'll be back in one minute. You go in the next room and, you know, and you're like, hmm. You know, okay, I'm ready for my healing. It doesn't make sense. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. Now, mind you, do what you want to do. Do what you want to do. And you could be a gifted healer even. We know of gifted healers in other countries in this country that, that as gifted as they could be, they got pulled into stuff. So it happens. I try not to lose the respect for the gift. I, I separate them. There's the respect I have for their gift. Good, good job. God bless you. And I have a sadness for the part that got the best of them. That's how I feel about that. I don't throw it all away. Careful about doing that because the ego and the evil of the world wants you to believe in nothing. Okay? So own, even in a relationship, if there was any goodness, even if it wasn't meant to be any longer, just give thanks for, if, not, there's a, if, if there were no goodness in it, give thanks at least for what you learned from it. Extra, extract something positive so that you're creating a better buzz instead of an unhealed wound. So back to the concept of chakras. Vortex is another word for chakra. Chakra is another word for vortex. And these vortexes, which is how it's pronounced. Some people say, Michael, it's vortices. It's either one, OK? <laughs> so, Go somewhere else and correct somebody else, OK? Um, these plural vortexes, vortex I, no. <laughs> um, these vortexes, there's seven major on the planet. And Sedona's not one of them. Oh, there's this you know, hush in the room every time I've ever said that. Now, wait a minute. I opened a massage center here, and you're dissing my, you know, and you're, now I'm not going to have customers. What Sedona is, is the most concentrated number of vortexes in a, one area. So it's unique. It isn't one of the seven primaries. One of the seven primaries that I will tell you where they are used to be Washington, DC, and it moved. Yeah. When the forefathers came to this country and said, this is the place, these were masters. These guys knew what they were doing. In case you don't know some of that history. They knew what they were doing. They doused it. They felt it. They knew it. And they planted right there in a vortex. It didn't take long for corruption and ego to take over that town. The vortex moved to Virginia Beach, which is why Edgar Casey ended up opening his center and working there. You know, this, this can happen. The vortex is allowed to say, you know, I don't like you anymore. And I'm exaggerating, but you get what I'm saying. It's allowed to say, you're not holding up to the vibe. We'll go over here. So they can move. But the Great Pyramid, Giza, is another major chakra on the planet. And some people will say, well, oh, I thought, I thought it was my backyard. You don't want a major vortex in your backyard. OK, you don't want that. Vortex, energy, stimulation, it's like you know what I mean? Like, you're like living in this power plant. It, it doesn't, it's not very calming. So Sedona can be very hyper stimulating. Sedona is also, and sadly, a lot of people that are mentally unstable are attracted to high energy places. But the worst thing about it is it can break them. That's um, Glastonbury, England, Sedona. You know, there's several places like that. Brazil has a lot of that. Brazil is, it's, its whole geology is crystals. They just, they're living on quartz crystals. And, you know, this is, you know, you've heard crystals do a couple of things in particular, but the main thing, magnifying anything they're used for. And so let's live in one. So there's this, you know, constant hyper stimulation, which is, you know, it could be great for a healing center, and it can also set people off. So the ancients of this area said, do not live in Sedona. You come here to visit for your vision quests, for healing and inspiration. Then you leave. You know, and that's not the way we do things. 
let's move in. You know, as soon as they said don't, we, oh, I gotta do that. <clears throat> they don't know what they're talking about. Um, they do know what they're talking about. It's a high energy place and it sets off a lot of people. If you come here and you find yourself not sleeping well, it's the energy, honestly, it's keeping you awake because it's too, it's like you're just doing intravenous coffee. You know, there's a lot going on. But if you also find yourself experiencing intense emotional breakdown, it's not you or there's something wrong with you. It's you walked into a place that magnifies things. So Sedona is unique in that it has a greater concentration of mini, minor vortexes, a greater concentration of those than any other place on the planet. But it's not a major chakra. It's unique in just the reason I said it was unique. So it's powerful, but it is not one of the seven major chakras. We also, you see, so you have chakras, majors, but you also have minor chakras, and Sedona is one of the minors, but the, one, basically the most intense of the minor chakras. Almost like one of the seven chakras, B, you know, classification B. It's almost there, but it's not one of those. Um, now, I know there's people that are going to tell you, yes, it is. Okay, that's because they're trying to sell you something, okay? It, it isn't one of the major chakras, and if you were mistaken in telling people, it's okay. It is, in its own way, it is the most intense of all because of the multiple chakras here, the multiple vortexes. So, there's also minor chakras, and there's also acupuncture points all throughout the planet. Some people confuse energy points that are just acupuncture points of the planet with major chakras. So there's a lot of misunderstanding about that. It's kind of a bummer. Some people overestimate this whole story about vortexes and chakras. They make a big deal out of it, you know. Oh, t we're going to go to a vortex and become holy today. You don't know what you're walking into. If you're a little screwed up, you're going to be very screwed up when you're done in that vortex because it's going to magnify things. You might also be one of the many that say, I sat down and I saw God. It does happen. People are healed of diseases. It's true. There's people that over embellish the chakra concept. Now, I'm not saying because they're nothing and they shouldn't be embellishing. I'm saying they don't understand them, so they shouldn't be talking. Okay? Understand what these are. Energy places. They're not guaranteed to do you good, they're guaranteed to magnify. There's also people that underestimate, especially those who try to intellectualize chakras. Do you know why human beings try to intellectualize anything? It is a way to push it away from yourself. The more you think about something, the more you're actually pushing it away. So there are people that know unconsciously that there are chakras and energy things in this planet that they don't understand. So what they do is they sit back, oh, I don't believe in that, and they talk from their head because they want to push it away because they're scared of it. So the more somebody's got a, you know, technology things, the more they're actually rejecting the energy in general. And the energy is uh, basically like a, an aura of God that we can step into. So people overestimate, they underestimate, and I'm saying don't do either, stay in your center. The greatest thing you can do with your chakras, your acupuncture points, your minor chakras, the planet, vortex, the greatest thing you can do is anchor the presence of God into those vortexes. By the way, this is the coolest thing of all. Well, where do I find these, you know, and how can I get to a vortex? When you have an altar room, or a favorite meditation spot even in your backyard. You are creating a spiral, and the more you do that work there, the spiral's becoming eventually an acupuncture point. It's, in a way, it's like digging a well that's really tapped into water systems under the planet, the earth, right, the crust? That's kind of what you're doing. You're creating your own little vortex, so nice job. Sacred sites all over the planet. It, it's so astounding that now they can, they can, because they choose to, they can go and take technology and go and, and douse with computers and whatever else to prove that places are higher energy than others. But the ancients didn't need that. They start, they're like, well, why do, you, why do you have to use a computer? Why? Well, because this proves it. We, we, to who? We already knew. Just ask us. You know, the Celts, Peruvians, they, they know what's going on. The church, you know, the, the traditional churches, but the one main powerful church, we have this church built 
Dedication to Mother Mary. And this one dedicated to Saint something or other and whatever. When they do archaeological digs, they find they're building churches on places that pagans already built things. Why? Because they were energy spots. Governments and churches tried to hijack the energy in those places. Even though they tell you on their shows there's no such thing. All they're doing is the, you know, bait and switch. Hey, look over there. Control, control, control. This is what they're doing. <laughs> Bloody hell. You know, they, they you, you go out to see these sites and they've all, they're either closed or they're charging money or they're just allowing people to go in there and swarm them. And it's a mess. It's annoying to say, hey, let's go overseas. You guys want to go? Let's go. 20 of us, we go overseas, and we're going to go to sacred sites. And, you know, people just, the noise. Oh, look. Look, a, a statue. Oh, you know, and they've forgotten what it's all about. It's just be quiet and feel this. Something magical is happening that you won't, you know, experience with your senses. Just listen and feel. Oh, it's just, it's craziness. You go in the Great Pyramid. Oh, it's a wonderful experience. You can do powerful meditations, toning and chanting. We've done that. It's wonderful. Gone many times. But there's, there's the constant pay me and I'll let you go in there privately. Pay me and this and that and the other. You know, and it's just, so I've gotten very turned off to that. And besides that, what matters is be the vortex you want to see in the world. You know? Yeah, right. What is a vortex? A place of energy. Do I seem depressed? Vortexes, they're places of energy. The presence of God is here. I don't claim to be perfect and by us other people's standards, but I do plug in so I can feel something the way a site, sacred site, is activated. Two, you know, 2,000 years of Buddhist meditations in this temple, you know something powerful is there. But people asked me 10, 12 years ago, Buddhist masters, the Tibetan Buddhists came through here, other groups of Buddhists, um, and also Native American elders. And they said to us, out of all the sacred sites and vortexes in, in this town, unity of Sedona is the strongest we've ever felt. Why? Because we, we moved onto one? No, because I said so. That's why it's the strongest site. Because I said so, meaning I have decided to anchor the presence of God here. I don't just anchor us doing boogaloo, you know, whatever. I don't just anchor us doing drumming and a beer. It's an absolute devotion to love, to God, to light. And so all the universe, there's a saying, make your home a place angels would seek to dwell. So if you are a member, owner, attendee of Unity of Sedona, can we agree that we want this to be a place that angels would seek to dwell? Yes. Good, good. See, it's not just a place to hang out. It's not, a, I want a gathering place. Uh, we'll call it Friendship Conversation Center. You should have it. Go, go do that. I want nothing more than God. Go for the best, you get the best. So these people that have complimented us, and we were at a different location. Oh, shoot. That means we walked away from the vortex. No, we moved it. It's here. If we act incongruent like Washington, D.C., the vortex will move. And I refuse to ever allow, allow that to happen. I can't even imagine what I would have to do so incongruently. And it wouldn't be one mistake. It wouldn't be like, you know, somebody says, hey, Michael, we're sitting out of the picnic area. Want to try a beer? Which is repulsive to me as a taste anyway. Um, but if I did, and somebody's going, did you, Michael was drinking a beer on the property, now the whole vortex is shattered. <laughs> no, that wouldn't be what could shatter such a powerful experience. I would have to lose my mind on so many levels to shatter this energy. And you guys know that we're pretty insistent on a certain, you know, not, not obsessed on perfection, but, but really insistent on a certain integrity, energetic integrity. And we do our best. Even if we slip, we do our best to maintain that. And the universe says, thank you. And one way it says thank you is by showing up and supporting it. So it comes and dances. You know, it's like, um, 
It's like a, you open a business and you get those people outside, you know, to do the signs, right? Come on in, free car wash or whatever it is, right? The angels do that here. They show up and they say, we're going to help your business, but it's not linear business. We're going to help your business. We're going to help your center. You're dedicating to God. God's asking us to support you in this. We're going to come there and dance on a regular basis, 24-7. Some angels or another group of it will be dancing here, calling people to come and heal. See, it becomes its own thing. So instead of us manufacturing a, a seeming vortex chakra with, with technologies, mechanical means, which can be grid lines and copper tubes and whatever else, God first. You can do the other because it'll support what you're doing spiritually, energetically. But the, your intention does it. You don't have to know anything about grid work, which I'll talk about real quickly, but if you're a good parent, you're anchoring good energy into that household. There is no greater sacred site on the planet than a place where you have love and forgiveness. You could have the great pyramid of Giza, you know, that's a major chakra, the great pyramids there, you have all this history, Atlantean, Egyptian, and so on. Amazing stuff going on there. And you could have your own household having a higher energy today because of your practice of love and forgiveness than anything found in Giza. Honestly, there is no more sacred place on this planet than in your heart, which is the altar to God. This is your most holy place. Come from love and forgiveness, and it is a place angels would seek to dwell. And it's so cool to live like that. You know, you just feel inspired. You feel alive. We have our days. We, uh, yes, we have our, our moments, the roller coaster ride of life, a little bit up, a little down. But for the most part, this starts to become alive and people can feel it. You know, it's, it's an attractive vibe. So, and some people will be afraid of it and repelled by it. That happens too. You know, there's too much light, you know? Well, if, if they're creepy crawlies that live under rocks, they're not going to dig the fact that you're anchoring light. So it kind of happens that way too. But the most important thing, besides realizing that the greatest sacred site is in your own heart on the altar of God, the greatest thing you can do in terms of developing chakras, vortexes, understanding them, isn't the information that you gather about them. The greatest thing you can do is remember to anchor God wherever you are. And you can do that kind of casually in all the things you do in life. But the one you do repetitively, meaning I can take God to the grocery store, to the whatever, to the car wash, whatever. But I also anchor it every Sunday right here. I also anchor it in a place in my backyard, let's say. If you want to do grid work, if you want to take this concept a little further, and I'm saying this because it's not all Sedona. There's people watching from all around the planet. If you want to be more active with this, then think of a place that you want to anchor the light of God. It can be your house, right? It can be moments. You can anchor the presence of God, and you should be, when you make love to somebody. Make this a holy experience where the two of us are not seeing ourselves as two, but as one. And you're making it a holy sight. You could do it when you have dinner. I'm making this my, this is my where I sit down, and I get to decompress and enjoy food, that could become a, a site for you to do your work. But what I'm saying is, when you go to sites, the, the vortexes in Sedona for that matter, um, Giza or wherever else on the planet, major chakras, minor chakras, you sit and you think, focus, be in the presence of God. You choose to anchor in the presence of God. Any wording you use, whatever it happens to be, it's your intention. There is but God. I am that I am. And you hold that presence. You fill up with that presence where you literally see, visualize yourself being a holy light being. Then something very organic would usually happen, and that is... Ooh, a sound will come through. And it can be, ooh, 
ooh, it can be, oh, it can be. What? I'm not saying you're singing. You don't break into Bohemian Rhapsody. <laughs> you do this something that's organic. You're feeling, I'm feeling, I'm feeling, I see and feel the light. Oh, it's good enough. Just go, a sound. Let the sound you feel come out. Great. Now, imagine that sound. Get in the groove and do that a few times. Then imagine. Again, you're holding the Christ light. You're letting the Christ light make a sound. Then take that energy and infuse it like, like you're an acupuncture needle right into the site. I've gone to Stonehenge. Boom, right into that site. Many others. Small temples, major temples. Boom. Great Pyramid of Giza. Boom. You pull that right in. You see? And then the mother is going to say, oh, thank you. You infused God presence right there. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take that energy like an acupuncturist and I'm going to move it to places that need it. I'm going to take a little here. I'm going to take a, I'm going to channel this one to an acupuncture point. I'm going to channel this one to a major chakra. You are more holy than locations geologically and geographically. You're the co-creator of the entire universe. So don't underestimate your value. It does us no good for you to do that. I am part of God and I am very holy. As one affirmation says, I am part of God and I am very holy. You show up and you make this moment a place that angels would seek to dwell. You show up and change the vibration in, in your center, your spiritual center. You don't go to a center and talk about places that are powerful and holy, unlike you. You choose that holiness. Make the sacred sites of the planet jealous at how holy you are. I don't mean literally, but okay. Make, them, make, make Giza want to go, oh, man, the whole pyramid, poof, uproot, and you know, across the ocean, and you wake up tomorrow, and it's planted over the Hyatt, you know? <laughs> I had to come up with one weird thing to say, right? <laughs> so Im imagine, I mean, it is so beautiful, but, but honestly, the mother doesn't need you to always go to them or have them come to you. The mother wants you where you are is holy enough. If you don't have the money to go on a sacred sites tour, don't worry about it. Be the holiness. Go to the, the vortexes here and download that energy. Go and infuse that site with holiness. You can, and it's your destiny. So think about that. And the planet, oh, just soaks it, sponges it, man. Just soaks up that beautiful vibe. Right? And I am part of God, and I am very holy. And the mother's going to take that energy somewhere downstream, you, I often call it, but even in the meridian lines. And there's, there's some... There's some woman who doesn't have a lot of family, been ostracized and whatever from her church, and she's got nothing but her backyard, and she goes and sits, you know, feeds the birds. The mother will know how to turn her little site into another acupuncture point, and how to take your work in Sedona, halfway around the planet even, and move through the grid systems, that's the meridian lines, through the grid systems to that woman who sits there. She might just be feeding birds and suddenly, She'll have maybe a spiritual epiphany. Maybe she'll just feel comforted. But see, the mother's going to take your work and use it to feed others. Just like an acupuncturist does. They say, well, this is hyperactive. This is underactive. Let's channel this energy over here. It's a very amazing healing ecosystem. So keep this in mind, please. Vortexes, energy, spirals. It's life. And I choose to infuse not spiraling backwards into fear and hate and death and judgment and gossip. I want my spiral not only to turn the right direction, but to enhance. And I want to be that chakra. I want to be the presence of God everywhere I go. And if I go to a sacred site, I will bring the presence of God where I go. Go up to the Buddhist stupa. Go over to this church. Go over to that well. Whatever you want to do, but bring the presence of God. There is no higher energy thing, consciousness, than God. So bring the highest to that place and make it a holy place. Thank you. Please take a few centering breaths.
centering, centering. When we inhale, hear the words, I am. When you exhale, hear the words, at peace. We know there are things you could focus on and stress about, but you're choosing not so. You're choosing centering. I am. I am relaxed. I am at peace. Centering, concentrating on that concept. Imagine sitting, still, quiet, and yet not just today. You're sitting in timelessness. There's a gentle whirl of energy that starts to build from in your heart center, and it grows and builds until it gently engulfs you, surrounds you. Mm. I am the presence of God. Will you dance with me today? Will you allow me to give you a poem? I inspire you? Can I comfort you? I am the energy of love, and I'm here now with you. You can feel it, the way the snake comes up out of the basket, evoked from the flute. <laughs> I can feel you, God. language, a light language. The energy, the movement, the music, it's here. Sound, hand mudras. Movement. Just follow it. It can be total stillness. It can be peace. It can be movement. state, let it come to your memory, your consciousness. The Divine Mother brings it to you. Can you remember any other site on the planet that was anchoring into a chakra vortex that you once danced at, played at, sat in a circle, ceremony? Is there any place on the planet that's familiar to you? Have you been there before? Let it come to your mind. Celtic forests, Peruvian highlands. Ancient Lemuria. Or modern times. There is no time and distance. It's an illusion. When you did the work then, you were building the work for today. The work you're doing today is reconnecting you with the work you did then. That's a great way of saying all my relations which doesn't mean all my relatives. 
It means all of the good ever done is feeding the good of today. My relationship with goodness is here, always. in this service, remembering theirs. So what is the number? Is it just one time I sat and did this? No. Countless. How many times we have held space in a healing center, holding a person in pain, being a healer, being a midwife, sitting in a circle around a fire, the highest peaks, or floating in the ocean, listening to the sounds of the orca, the dolphin. It's all here now. All times of prayer, devotion is here now. And I am part of that. I am part of God and I am very holy. And I am choosing to anchor this light presence, all my relations to all times of prayer and dedication, meditation, are here with me now. And I, wherever I sit, whatever planet, whatever continent, whatever city, where I am, I'm anchoring this light into the earth below me, the planet below me, the star below me infusing this with God's presence. It will feed downstream to all other chakras, meridians, and people, as well as this planet being a chakra itself, feeding the, the other planets in the solar system, feeding the sun and all the star systems. The whole universe, because of our intention today, being activated. The whole universe Responding to the tone, responding to the tone of God. This is a holy place. Breathe in a sense of gratitude, a calming exhale, a wave of peace across the globe. Inhale again. Yes. Exhaling. Yes, yes, yes. All my relations. Everyone. The presence of God is here. One more time. In. This time on the exhale a sound and keep the sound going for about a minute. Power. You're 
sending this vibe, you're sending this prayer everywhere in the universe. Scared, lonely people, they feel this. part of God and I am very holy. Places of famine and fear, wild fires, corrupt politics, they're just places that went dark and forgot the light. And we're infusing every place, everything with this light. We feed them with love and light, not react to them. We feed them with love and light. Every person is worthy, every creature worthy of God's presence. And so it is. What an extraordinary experience. Mm. Thank you so much. We're going to take up our collection and then do our closing prayer. I don't want you to stir around in your heads or too much and all that just be as generous as you can be. Share a donation. We greatly appreciate you being here. And while they're passing the bags and baskets around, we'll just have about a minute of feedback from everybody. And if you're watching online, continue watching because you'll hear some of the comments and feedback that might be helpful to you. And then you'll be part of our closing prayer as well, of course. Before they pass the baskets, a couple of quick things. First, Remember that chaplains are available. They'll be doing a healing circle after the service. I want you to remember I do private sessions, and people ask about it all the time. I don't often um, announce it, but I do private sessions, uh, phone and Zoom and all that. Um, but remember, you book a session. You have to show up for the session at that time. Often people are like, oh, I thought I was in a different time zone. You, you are. Um, <laughs> You need to be in Arizona's time zone. Call and find out. Look online. It'll tell you what time that is. Be at the right time so you don't miss your session, OK? It's very important. We say it all the time, but people make the mistakes. And they're not reading the, the confirmation material that tells them that. So please do that. It's for your sake, I tell you. All right, um, remember, today is the Sedona Psychic Fair. It's once a month. 
We're gracious, you know, grateful to be the host of this, but it's once a month. It'll be here today about an hour after service. Um, and uh, let's see. Uh, for, for Jade and John, for their music today, please, one more time. <laughs> Do your best to arrive on time. We try to start the services five minutes till, if not on the hour, but try to get here a few minutes before. That way we can more accurately, more and more, end on time. And um, on Sunday, June 26th, we have a workshop coming up. It's next weekend. Initiations, the seven initiations on the spiritual path. I'll be conducting that workshop in the afternoon, like 12 to 3. Um, we're going to go a lot of different places, but in a nutshell, it's understanding the purpose to life's tests. And there are several of those tests going on right now for a lot of people. Um, and OK, we got those. And then uh, one last thing. If you're watching online here, later on online, or if you're watching online now, or you're watching us on YouTube a day later, a month later, please remember a couple things. Whether it's on my Facebook group or YouTube, when you want to post comments, they have to get approved by us. If they're too lengthy, it's hard to post them because people get lost, or if they're incoherent. Um, it, you know, just make your statements post as simple as possible because we have to read through hundreds every day. So we would appreciate if you would help with that. Um, and um, also keep in mind uh, workshops and special events. Um, we've got those going on, so if you're on YouTube, you might not know about these because it's not the same kind of a network that some other social media is. You just go watch a video. You guys won't know about some of these things, so please get on our mailing list at Unity of Sedona or go to my Facebook, Friends of Michael Myrdad Facebook group and join us there. And you can also then, if you get on that group, you can join us for the uh, Zoom program at 11 o'clock every Monday. We do an hour or two of just free-flowing conversation sharing and so on. So we'd greatly appreciate that. So your, um, you know, your continued support and your blessings are just deeply, deeply appreciated. And uh, how did you dig the service and the meditation? It worked out? Nice. Nice. Thank you. Hold presence in your heart and soul for everybody's prosperity and abundance all around the world, all around the universe. <sighs> Together, please, divine love flowing through me blesses and multiplies all that I am, all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. And so it is. Thank you. <clears throat> so while they're passing that, and then we'll do our prayer, does anybody have anything to share? What did you learn or hear today that made the most sense, that could help you in some way, or help you to help others in some way? Yes. Be the vortex you want to see in the world. Yeah? It's a good bumper sticker waiting to happen, huh? What's that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's, you know, and, and I hope you even got that whole conversation about when you're going to, when you want to set a tone, it's got to be you set the tone in your household. And if you have a business, set the tone in your business. I've had people call me for consultations and, oh, you know, they've got this rebellion going on. This employee doesn't like that employee, da, 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 da. You know what I tell them? I don't say, oh, well, you just have to let it happen. I tell them fire everybody and then announce that your business is going to start up again tomorrow. And it's a business of getting along. Don't reapply if you can't get along. Sometimes firmly set the tone and say it's going to be this or nothing. You see? Same as you should do in partnerships. This or nothing. What do you think? I, I need somebody to sit and talk to? I mean, come on. If I have to exchange companionship conversation with living in hell, no. No, I'd rather be alone in heaven than in a group of people in hell. I'm good, you know. Insist on goodness in your life. And you have to, of course, take responsibility for your own participation, contributions. Anyone else, what did you learn or hear today that made the most sense? I am worthy. Worthiness. I am worthiness. Yeah. The unworthiness that's deeply ingrained, but the worthiness. You guys get, and you, did you, yes, dear? Right.
Right. So I'm actually working under the crystals, and the bottom of the feet is a microcosm. Right. Right. That's right. That's right. It's um, it's how things subdivide, and it still is the same. Like in Egypt, along the Nile, you have seven temples, each symbolizing the seven major chakras. It isn't the seven major chakras that are all sitting on the Nile. They're all around the planet, but it's its own microcosm of the seven chakras. The crystal bed therapy, those are seven lights, crystal lights, cut particularly like the Vogel crystals, cut the specific way and over the chakras to help balance the centers, you know, right here. I mean, it's just amazing how these things connect, right? All right, please stand for our closing prayer. I have to say that, you know, y'all did a, a, an extraordinary um, job at allowing that meditation to happen. The music, they just went right with that. And we don't pre-plan this meditation or the music. Um, it, and it just, they went right with us and you with them and it was very, very beautiful. Um, were you guys having good success at seeing and feeling other times? Yeah, yeah, good, good. Isn't that cool? You can see, feel, masters and elders and Tibetan temples and Peruvian temples all over the planet going, wow, who just plugged in, you know? Us! <laughs> it's just us. It's how we roll, you know, and, um, and we're enhancing the light on this planet and in the world for people and in the universe. Ah, with that in mind, we sit in a state of gratitude. Hmm. The light of God surrounds us. We are the, light of God. the love of God enfolds us. We are the, love of God. the power of God protects us. We are the power of God. And the presence of God watches over us. We are the presence of God. Wherever we go, God, God is, is, I am, am we, we are, are, and so it is. Peace be with all of you. Bye-bye.